basically, when we are talking about malocclusions in children, sometimes is underdiagnosed. It has to be something really relevant that we may see it. And if we start looking closer, we are going to see that many kids, many young children, they have already signs of malocclusions. And this is a study in Canadian children. And we can see that in this study, they are showing that there are developing malocclusions that we can start managing at a very early age. And this is another study that I did in, in Brazil. And when we look at the numbers, for kids between five and eight years old, we see a lot of malocclusions. We are seeing that 55% of the kids in primary dentition or early mixed dentition, they already have signs of malocclusion, a class one malocclusions. About 20% of the kids, they already present signs of a distal occlusion or a class two malocclusion. About 11% of the kids present signs of class three malocclusions. So it means that we are talking about 90% of the kids are presenting already signs of malocclusions. And we need to help them because some of them are having problems already in, in many ways that I am gonna try to present you tonight. But when we start seeing what is the best time to treat a child to improve the growth and development in the craniofacial complex. Normally, we think that we have to wait until they are, they are teenagers, because that is the normal saying around, and we repeat that. But if we look at the evidence, if, if we look when the jaws are growing more, it's over the first years of life. This is a very interesting study, and it is very applicable because it's made in Canada. This is with the, with the bulletin database. And when it was done by Professor Liu, they measure the dimensions of the mandible from four months of age until the patients were 16 years of age. And they found that over the first five years, the mandible grows approximately 35 millimeters. And then when they compare from five years of age to 16 years of age, the mandible grew approximately 31 millimeters. So it means that over the first five years, the mandible grew more than over the next 11 years that we have the poverty here. And normally we are saying that this is the best time for mandibular growth, and it is not. It is over the first five years. So if I am seeing a lack of development of the mandible, and I stimulate that growth over the first five years, I'm gonna get a better response rather than waiting until the poverty stage. And if I look at the maxilla, it's exactly the same. If we look, all the growth changes that occur between half to five years of age were generally greater than the changes in the maxillary growth that occur between five and 16 years. So the maxilla is growing more as well over the first five years. And if we are seeing a problem in a child in the primary dentition, probably that's the best time to treat it and to stimulate the growth or to guide the craniofacial growth to become in a normal way. So this is a, a general growing curve that you may find in any book. And normally what we repeat is that this peak, when the patient is about teenager, is the best time to stimulate growth. And if we analyze all the data, we are seeing that probably we should make even earlier because at about five years of age, we have a similar growing pro potential of that one that we are gonna have later. And if we treat the, the kid when it's younger, it's even better. 
And if we compare with the functions, if you think about a malocclusion in a child, let's think about an open bite. Normally, open bite is associated because the patient is breathing through the mouth. And the mouth breather is established when the patient is about one year of age. So if I want to correct the breathing, it's easier to correct when the child is younger rather than waiting until he's a teenager. And if I have problems because the jaws are not growing very well, because today we have a very soft diet, and we are going to talk a little bit about that later, mastication is established when we are about four years of age. Uh, so if I have a problem that I want to stimulate more activity in the mouth through mastication, it's easier to do here when the, my patient is younger than waiting until it's a teenager. However, if I want to treat here, I need to look for techniques designed for the child, not techniques designed for the adults. Because if I am treating, for example, a child four years of age, I cannot put braces in the mouth. I have to do something different. And that's the techniques that I am going to share with you today. What is the technique that I may use, and I can treat the, the problems that we are seeing in the growing child. So the other problem is that we have to evaluate the orofacial functions, how the child is breathing, how the child is chewing, how the child is swallowing. Because if we have problem in the function, that is going to move the growth and development in the wrong direction. Re let's repeat the example. If my patient is breathing through the mouth, it's going to push the jaws to grow in a wrong direction. I need my patient breathing through the nose. So there is enough evidence that if my functions are not correct when the child is over the first years of age, that is going to produce a lot of malocclusions. So we need to take care not only of the position of the teeth, but also to take care of correcting the functions in the child so we can bring everything to normality or to a physiological pathway that is going to produce a better growth and development at that age. So let's see. This is a very common situation. We have an open bite. And an open bite is associated with tongue thrust. And the most common appliance that normally we think when we have an open bite is to put a lingual creep. I have nothing against lingual creep. They are very good appliances. However, when you see the creep in the mouth, most of them are positioning very back, just at the back in the area of the canines. And the problem here is that we have the tongue. And the tongue can produce a very, very strong force. And that's why a lot of patients are breaking the creep very frequently. The parents finally, they say, we give up, all right? And the problem of the open bite is the tongue. So if I put an appliance, and I use this appliance in kids, that is the infant trainer, it's a very gently appliance that is going to help the tongue to be educated and be in the right position. So if I put the, the tongue in the top of the mouth, instead of between the teeth, I'm going to permit the jaws to close. And then the open bite can close with no problem. And it's a very easy way for the patient to start using it. And it's not invasive. And the patients collaborate because they use this appliance only during the night. So they don't have to take the appliance to the school. Basically, they are using the appliances at home. And other problem that we may find very frequently in the office is cross bites. And the cross bites probably is the most common situation that the parents are asking for something, for treatment, because they recognize that there's something wrong with the bite, even in a very young child. So today we know that correcting a cross bite is very important to happen at a very early age. The earlier that we can correct a crossbite, the better. Why? Because if the patient is, for example, 
biting to the front all the time, the patient has an anterior crossbite, the mandible is gonna grow excessively and then the patient could end up in a surgery. If the patient has a posterior crossbite, the mandible is shifting to the side and then the grow is gonna go in that direction and we are gonna have a problem later of asymmetry of the mandible and then we may have problems in the future. So there is enough evidence and the American Academy of Pediatric Dentistry in the guidelines they recommend that as soon as we see a crossbite, we should start a treatment as early as possible. So let's see a child that she's a beautiful girl, three years old, okay? And when we start examining her, we went to check her mouth and we can see an anterior crossbite. This is very interesting case because if I tell you that this patient came to the office and with an anterior crossbite and she left the office without an anterior crossbite and that's possible, all right? Because when we are seeing a crossbite in a child we have to look for the cause of the crossbite. And normally, what is happening is that when a child is closing, the child is getting a dental interference. And that produces a shift of the mandible to the front. And by shifting the mandible to the front, the patient is gonna learn to jump that interference and then closing in that direction. And that is gonna stimulate mandibular grow in a sagittal way. And we want to avoid that. So basically what we have to do with the patient is to look where the interference is. Where is that point that the patient is contacting and then shifting the mandible to the front? And if we identify that, I can release that interference and then the patient can come to a normal situation. So what I did with this patient was the interference, as you see here, was on the central incisors in this case. In many cases, it's on the, on the canines. But in this case, it was on the central incisors. So basically what I did was grinding the upper incisors in a direction from vocal to lingual, and then grinding the lower incisors in the opposite direction. So I created an inclined plane with the teeth and then the patient was sitting the jaw in the right position. And then everything continued function with no problem. And if I see a child like this with the spaces, with a normal class one canine relationship, I don't expect problems in the future. I have just to follow and the patient is gonna go with no problem. Another situation that we have a, a more severe crossbite, anterior crossbite, in a very young girl, about five years of age. So if we start looking at the interferences and we create with the treatment, in this case, I needed to restore the, the incisors because she had cavities in those incisors. So what I did was with the strip crowns, I restored the four incisors, but by correcting the incisors, I shift the position of the, of the crown. In this way, instead of creating the crown, putting the crown in the same position that we have the tooth, I use tip the crown a little bit to create an inclined plane with the crown, and then the patient came to the normal position. Right? So it's very simple and it's not invasive and we can correct at a very early age and a crossbite, very simple way. And the patient continued developing with no problem and we went from this situation to this situation in a couple of months. And if you want to read that, uh, how to do this technique, I published a paper in the Pediatric Dentistry Journal of 2011 and it's available on the web. So you can have the, the full paper where I describe this technique and it's very simple. But the most important part for me 
is not only correcting the anterior cross by. The most important part is to put all the system working together in a physiological way. And that's what Professor Son described in the American Journal of Orthodontics in 1997. One of the purpose of correcting an anterior cross bite should be to change the occlusal force. And by changing the occlusal force, we are going to stimulate the receptors in the periodontium. And by stimulating the receptors in the periodontium, we are going to change the message to the trigeminal nerve to the brain. And by changing the message to the brain, we are going to change the activity of the muscles. And that's the most important part for me, that we change the whole system. And the whole system is becoming working in a natural way, in a more physiological way. So when we think about that, we can start working in a better way and produce results very quick. And if you see, this patient is an anterior cross by, but he is already in a mixed dentition. He's about nine years old. And normally, when I am treating the patient, I try to interact with the patient a lot, trying to make a joke, trying to make it, uh, the patient laugh, trying to create a better environment. When he, with him, it was impossible. He didn't want to smile. He didn't want to laugh. He didn't want to say anything. And when I saw his mouth, I understood that. He didn't like his mouth. So I started talking with him. And he said, yes, I, I don't like my mouth. I, I want to have something better. And we start talking, and I offer him some treatments. And the treatment at this age is to maintain the jaw, the lower jaw, in an edge-to-edge -edge position to permit the maxilla to develop. The problem when we have a situation like, like this is the maxilla is trapped by the mandible. So cannot be an anterior development of the maxilla. So the first step should move the mandible low, lower in the mandible to permit an edge-to-edge -edge position. And we did through building up with composite a guide here that is called a planus direct track. I will explain you why I call planus direct track in a minute. But this is holding the vertical dim dimension. So when the patient is closing the mouth, the mandible is not going forward and producing the anterior cross bite. And then I combine that with another trainer, another appliance, that is a removable appliance, that is designed to stimulate maxillary development. And if you see, we started the treatment in May of 2010. So we combined two techniques, the Planet Direct Tracks and the Trainer I3. And with these two techniques, in August of 2010, we were in this situation. So basically, in four months, we were correcting the anterior cross bite with a very non-invasive technique by combining techniques and guiding the craniofacial growth and development. All right? So you can see the change in the profile, the change in the appearance of the face of the child. Now he looks like a child. Before, he, he looked like a very old person. Because when we have a reduction of the inferior fair of the face, we look like aging. So by increasing the vertical dimension, we are reducing that appearance, and the child looks much better now. But for me, the, the beauty of this treatment is that not only correcting the problem of the anterior cross bite, Obviously, we are preventing a lot of problems in the future. But when I look at the electromyography and the muscular activity in this patient, when we had the cross bite, the temporalis and masseter muscles were totally stretched. They were stretched to the front, and they couldn't produce any activity. 
because the mandible was locked at the front. Immediately, we release that, and we change the activity. They start producing the natural movements and the natural muscular activity. If I compare this muscular activity with the activity of a child without a malocclusion, it's very similar. So that's why it's, for me, very important not only to correct the problem at the teeth, it's also to correct the full system to see all the picture, the whole picture, and changing the activity of the muscles. So we went from this situation to this situation, all right, in about four months. Then we follow the patient for a couple of years, and you can see that everything is stable, that he continue developing between normal limits. So we don't expect a problem in the future. Uh, we can intervene. So if we see there is a lot of problems in the kids, and the evidence today is saying if you see a problem, start treating it as soon as possible. Because all these symptoms that we are seeing are going to create problems in the mandible and maxillary growth. So we need to start treating them. and creating a better situation for our patients. Another situation is the opposite. When we have a class two problem, when we have a retruded mandible, all right? And today we have evidence. We used to say, oh, don't treat the patient early because probably with the natural growth is going to catch up. And that never happened. And today we have evidence. Professor Bachetti published a very interesting study in the American Journal of Orthodontics. And he stated that all the kids that they evaluated with a distal occlusion, they maintained the distal occlusion through the mixed dentition and to the permanent dentition. So they never corrected by itself. So if we are seeing a problem of a retruded mandible, and we are seeing a distal occlusion, we should start treating that as early as possible because we know that the mandible is going to respond better. The earlier, the better. So this is a common case that normally we see in the office. And we say to the parents, no, everything is OK. If I look in detail, the patient already has a problem. We are saying that the patient is OK but we don't evaluate the overbite. In this case, for me, it's a deep bite. Because if you look at this child, thinking in the permanent dentition, the overbite is OK, about 2 to 3 millimeters. But in a child, the overbite should be 0 to 1 millimeter. So if I have a 50% overbite here, for me, it's already a deep bite. And the other problem is that if I have a 2 millimeters over jet, that patient is going to be a class 2 in the future. Because if you think the only tooth that erupts buccally to the primary is the central incisor. So if I have already a 2 millimeters over jet that I am considering normal, but the incisor, the permanent incisor, is going to erupt buccally, immediately I'm going to have a 4 millimeters over jet. So it's going to be a class 2. So this patient is already showing me that it's going to be a class 2. And if you check the canines, the canines are in a class 2 relationship. So the patient is already showing me that it's a class 2. If I start treating the patient with the the infant trainer, and I try to improve that overbite and that overjet, I can bring the patient to this relationship that is the normal occlusion in a primary dentition. It's the normal occlusion in a child before entering the mixed dentition. The overbite should be between 0 to 1 millimeters. The overjet, ideally, should be 0. The canines should be in a class one relationship. The molars should be in a initial step. And I should have spaces everywhere. 
if I am not seeing this situation in a child, the child is already showing me that has a malocclusion. And I should start something, right? So I can prevent a lot of problems in the future if I bring the child to this situation. So why this happen? Why a child is developing a malocclusion? And that's a big question for us in dentistry. And normally, we start saying, oh no, this is genetics. Because the, the mom has the problem or the dad has the problem, so this is going to be genetics. So I ask you, for example, these are sisters. I call these the three sisters, but you are going to see only two, because the older one didn't permit me to photograph, right? But if you see the sisters, they came as an immigrant here. And if you see the, the older one, she has a perfect occlusion. She's developing between normal limits. But if you see the younger one, she's already with lack of space for the canines, and she has a malocclusion. If everything is genetics, they should be the same. They should present the same occlusion. And if you see her lower face is a good development here, you can see that redu reduction of the lower face in, this, in the younger child. So we are getting problems in this child. When I investigate a little bit more with them, she was keeping the home diet, which was the home country diet. She loves all the junk food. And that is the reason. And if it is genetics, I will ask you, why these twins, he has a cross bite, she has a deep bite and this occlusion. If everything is genetics, they should be the same. And even more in them, because they are twins. They should express in the same way. So, to understand that, what is the situation, we need to understand how is the normal craniofacial growth and development through our life, since we were born and then until we become an adult. And this is a process of about 18 to 25 years. And during this time, we are influenced by the environment, and the environment is leading with the genetics all the development, that is differentiation of the tissues, all the growth, that is the increase in the size and chain of the shape, and how we adapt through plasticity. So all these processes are happening during the craniofacial growth and development. And yes, they are driven by genetics. By genetics is expressed depending on the environment. So that is what we call today epigenetics. Epigenetics is the science to study how the environment changed the expression of the genes. So we can modify our genetic expression. So it means that because the mom is a class two, not necessarily the child has to be class two. If the mom is a class three or the dad is a class three, not necessarily the child is going to be a class three. If we change the environment, we are going to change the expression of the genes, and the things can reverse. And you are making that through your life, but we don't apply that to the craniofacial complex. For example, if you start going today to the gym, you change the shape of your body. Because your genes make a different expression, influenced by the environment, because now you are working out. And you can make your bones bigger and stronger if you work out every single day. You are changing the environment, so you are changing the expression of the genes. So it is possible in the maxillaries as well, 
but we need to change. What happened? If I need to change something in a child, I need to involve the parents. Because if the parents like to eat pizza, hot dogs, and hamburgers every single day, I cannot ask the child to eat vegetables, meat, and fruits. I cannot change the diet of the child. And I finished recently on a study I don't have time to show today, but the harder the diet, the stronger the mandible is, and the bigger the mandible is. So everything started here, the day that we were born. And what happened? The day that we were born, our mom decided if she was going to breastfeed us or if she was going to use the bottle. And today we have a lot of babies with the bottle. And whenever we are feeding a child with the bottle, we are not creating a correct lip sealing. With the bottle, what happened is that mandible is dropping down because of gravity. The patient is basically, the child is basically using the cheeks to suck from the nipple instead of using the whole muscles, the whole masticatory muscles and the whole facial muscles. And we are not producing a lip seal. Then when the breast feeding is correct, the child is able to breathe through the nose. This is something very important when we are breastfeeding because the child should be able to suck from the mom, mom's breast but also to breathe through the nose. If the child is laying down, basically he is breathing from the, through the nose but also through the mouth and we have a mouth breather. And the child is not holding the nipple with the tongue because to milk the breast, the child has to push the nipple against the palate. And at this moment, the child is learning how to put the tongue on the palate, the physiological position of the tongue. And then, if I have this situation, the tongue is dropping down and staying on the mandible. What are you seeing today with the, with the children? No lip seals, they are with the mouth open all the time. They are breathing through the mouth. They don't put the tongue on the palate. And they have narrow dental arches. Because when you put the tongue on the palate, you are pushing the developing of the maxilla. And when you are developing of the, the maxilla, you are permitting the mandible to sit into the maxilla and to follow that growing. So the beginning is right here, when the child was born. And when is the time that we are growing more? Over our first year of life. Remember those who are parents, during the first months of life, you are buying clothes every single week. Because the next week, you, you bought something today, and tomorrow is not good for him again anymore. Because the child is growing a lot. And this is happening in the whole body, also in the head. So we need to produce the correct stimulus at this age. And this is a very interesting study, because one of the problems is that we are not stimulating the child at the first day to do breastfeeding. And the problem is that we are separating the child from the mom the newborn from the mom, we are keeping the baby away for a long period, and then we are asking the mom to try breastfeeding a couple of hours later. That is too long for the baby, and it's a natural instinct, the breastfeeding. This is a study that was made in Belarusia, and what they did was use having the baby, the newborn, cleaning the baby on the top of the mom, doing everything on the top of the mom, the child was not separated from the mom. Another group of child, they did in the traditional way. They separated from the mom. And you can see that the babies that were not separated from the mom, they naturally start crawling up and looking, looking for the 
source of feeding. So we are programmed to come and breastfeed. <laughs> the child that was separated from the mom, I can leave this video running the whole night. That child is not going to come to the breast. So we are cutting the natural instinct just from the very beginning. So we need to practice more. This child could learn how to grab the nipple, how to, to milk the breast. But we need to train the mom and the child. We need to work more with them. But what happened? <laughs> Everyone is in a rush. They don't want to, to expend too much time with the mom. We need to rush out everyone from the room. And we are dedicating the time to train the child for breastfeeding, right? So this is the natural position that we should be breastfeeding the child. The, the child shouldn't be laying down. The child should be sitting on the mom's lap. So in that way, the head is vertical, and the child is able to milk the breast and at the same time to breathe through the nose. And what is that important? Because when we are in that position, the lower jaw, the mandible, is start moving forward and backward. And that is going to stimulate the mandibular condyle that is one of the growing centers in the mandible. So think about this. Have you seen a newborn with a mandibular protrusion? If you start looking at all the newborns, they are with the mandible retruded. All the newborns have a convex profile because the mandible is small. The mandible have the size only to survive. And through this exercise, the mandible is going to grow and to catch up to the growth of the maxilla, and then to continue growing in the right position. So if we are not doing a correct breastfeeding, we are missing that important time for the mandibular growth. And that's why we are getting more and more malocclusions today. Another problem is tongue tie. A lot of newborns, they have a very strong tongue frenum or a very strong lip frenum. And we, as a dentist, we can help a lot. Because a lot of moms, they, cannot, they are trying to breastfeed the child, but the child is impossible for him or for her. And it's because the tongue cannot go to the palate and cannot milk the nipple, cannot pressure the nipple to produce the milk. So we can help. And it's very easy to cut that frenum in a newborn. It's, it's a, seconds we don't have to deliver anesthesia. We don't have to put local anesthesia, because this is a ligament. And in the ligaments, we don't have nerve endings. So we don't produce pain there. So we can cut very easy there that frenum. And you may see how the child starts breastfeeding with no problem. So this is a very good web page if you want to read a little bit about tongue tie and upper lip tie. But this is something that we can help a lot to the child when, when it's impossible to breastfeeding. And by putting the tongue on the palate, we are producing a balance of forces between the cheeks, the lips, and the tongue. And we are going to stimulate a natural growth of the maxilla. Think about something. If I put my tongue here on the palate, basically I am pushing up with my tongue. But the maxilla is the roof of the mouth, and at the same time is the floor of the nose, because it's the same bone. So if I am breathing through my nose, I am pushing down. So my tongue is pushing up. The airflow is pushing down my maxilla is going to grow to the side. And that's why we are producing a normal development. So what happens, for example, when you have a mouth breather? The mouth breather has to put the tongue down and forward. 
and put the tongue between the teeth. The tongue is going to produce a force that is going to produce a rotation of the jaw. If I use that force in my favor, I can reverse everything. Because the tongue is 17 muscles working together. So if I put those 17 muscles helping me, I can produce a lot of results in the child. But what happens if the patient starts with some habits? We are going to have forces changing from the outside. So the buccinator, which is the muscle of the cheeks, and the orbicularis oris, which is the muscles of the lips, they are going to increase the force. And then I remove the tongue from the palate. So basically, what I am creating is narrowing the maxilla. So let's see this, this child, four years old. If you look at here, she's opening the bite. And when we start asking her what's, gonna ha what's happening, we discover that this shape of the maxilla that is already triangular, instead of being rounded, that will be the ideal, is because she loves her tongue. And this is one of the appliances that I use for tongue suckers. This is the coffee stirrer. <laughs> so I put this little tube with tape on the finger, and I tell the child, all right, now you can suck your tongue as much as you want. But if you have the little tube, all the time that you want. And if your parents say something, you call me that they are in trouble with me. <laughs> all right? So what is the best friend of a child? Whoever says that he or she can do what they like and who stop the parents. All right? So in that way, I control the habit. Normally, the child don't suck the thumb anymore between two to three months. Why? Because the sensation of putting the thumb in the mouth is ruining the palate. And I am putting air through the tube. So that vacuum effect is not happening anymore. And it's not that pleasure. All right? So first, I control the habit. Then I deliver the appliance. But I don't say an appliance. To a child three or four years old, I don't say an appliance. I normally offer them, I know that you miss your thumb. So I'm going to give you the best suitor. And this is your new suitor. So you can use your suitor as many as you want. And it's the appliance that I need to correct the thumb posture. So by doing that, we went from this situation to this situation. So I know that we need to work a little bit more in creating spaces, developing. But now the open bite that was starting was reversed. We don't have that problem anymore. The tongue thrust is not happening anymore. When I have a, a child using the suture, I exchange the suture. I change the pacifier. I ask the patient to bring me the suture that they are using, and I give him the new suture, which is the appliance that I am using to correct the problem. So when I have any uh, habit, I work on the habit first, and then I start treating the problem. And I give the appliance. And in that way, I manage the habit. Because my goal is to bring the tongue to the top. If I keep the tongue on the palate, I am going to create the tongue producing forces outward that are going to counterbalance the force produced by the cheeks and the lips inward. And everything is going to be developing in a normal situation. However, if I, remove the, if I don't have the tongue on the palate, these forces are going to narrow the dental arch and then when I have a, a narrowed upper dental arch, the mandible has to move backward. And it's going to make worse the distal occlusion. Or in some cases that there is no place at the back for the patient to produce occlusion, dental occlusion, the patient is going to jump to the front, producing a class 3. So 
One of my goals during the treatment is that the tongue is on the palate. And normally I'm working with the kids with exercises teaching them how to put the tongue on the palate. And whenever I bring the tongue to the palate, I can potentiate the development of the maxilla. When I have a wider maxilla, the mandible can move forward and produce a better sagittal relationship. So basically, what I am seeing is the whole picture. I don't like to see only here. Whatever is happening here is the consequence of whatever is happening around. How the condyle is being stimulated. How the tongue is functioning in the mouth. How the masticatory muscles, the facial muscles, the supra and infrahyoid muscles in the neck are working. How is the quality of the bone in, in the jaws? How is the head posture on the cervical spine? The head weight is about 40 pounds. If I move my head forward, I have to change the posture of my body immediately. And I start producing problems on my back. I finished recently my thesis for the last master was changing the occlusion in animals and seeing how the vertebral spine was changing. And it's published in the Journal of Craniomandibular Practice, if you want to read it. And most importantly, how my patient is breathing. I want my patient breathing through the nose, not through the mouth. So whenever I am trying to produce a change on the teeth, I have to think that every time that I am producing a stimulus here, I am sending a message through the trigeminal nerve, <laughs> through the brain stem, where is the nucleus of the trigeminal nerve. And this nucleus is sending back a message to the muscles. And these muscles are going to produce an activity. However, if I want to change the activity of those muscles, I need to maintain the stimulus here for the brain through the hypothalamus and the cerebral cortex to produce new messages to the nucleus of the trigeminal nerve to change permanently the activity of the muscles. That is what you are doing when you are going to the gym. Whenever you, are start, you start working out, basically what you are doing is sending a message to the brain to make your muscles stronger. And when you make your muscles stronger, the muscles start loading the bones in a different way, and your bones are going to become stronger. So basically, it's guiding the craniofacial growth and development through the muscles, not through the teeth. In that way, we are thinking, thinking in another way. So this is a cute patient, and she is lovely. And you, you may see she is almost four years old, and she has an, a posterior cross by. And we identify the interference is in one of the canines. We do a little bit of grinding of that canine to correct. And then I put the planus direct tracks on the primary molars, which is basically building up a guide with composite. So I don't have to do anything on the teeth. Just etching and adding composite, and creating the guide to bring the jaw to the right position. And then we bring her to start slide, bringing the mandible to the right position and bringing the mandible to the center. Now that the cross bite is over and the patient is able to stay here, I need to produce development of the maxillaris, and I can use the trainer for producing that development. And I am going to show you the evidence that these appliances can produce transverse development. But one of the most important parts for me is not only treating the malocclusion, it's also thinking what I am preventing. And today we have evidence that posterior crossbites, patients with a posterior crossbite, they have temporomandibular joint disorders in the future. So there is evidence reporting that, that if you see a posterior crossbite in a child, you have a high risk of temporomandibular disorders in the adult. 
So basically, by correcting a posterior crossbite in a child, I am preventing the temporomandibular so disorder in the adult. And for me, that's very important as a pediatric dentist. Not only treating a problem, but changing all the situation that I am preventing other problems in the future. And if you want to read a little bit more, I published this paper in the Journal of Clinical Orthodontics in 2003 that I am presenting this case and I describe in the technique. If you may see, this patient is an anterior and posterior crossbite. And this patient went through several colleagues and normally they gave the, the most common answer. You have to wait, all right? And the mom was asking because she was seeing a lot of problems in here. And when she came to me, we offered the treatment. And this was about three to four, four months later. The crossbite was totally correct. So that paper is in the Journal of Clinical Orthodontics if you want to read a little bit more of the technique. Or you can read about the Planas direct tracks. This is Professor Pedro Planas, who was the person who proposed this technique for children. He, is, he was originally from Barcelona, Spain. And unfortunately, he passed away like 20 years ago. And he published everything in Spanish. He didn't publish in English. But don't worry, you have my book. <laughs> this is my book, Early Treatment of Malocclusions. And it is in English. And here I present the techniques step by step, all right? And one of the things that I like to do is whenever I like to offer, I want to offer something to my patient, I try it. I am sure that I know what my patient is going to feel, that my patient is going to be true. And all these techniques I have been using through my life, and my best patients are my two sons. These two boys, they are my sons. And it worked well. They are very handsome. That's because mom. <laughs> That's because mom, not for me. All right? That is not from my side. All right? But you have my book available. All right? But that's the concept that I manage. For me, it's not correcting the problem on the teeth. For me, it's correcting the whole system. And when I am correcting the whole system, I need to think about the muscles. I need to change the activity of the system to produce better results in the jaws and to produce better results in the position of the teeth. Because I need to send a message to the brain, and the brain can produce all the responses to change the activity of those muscles. And one of the major activity in the mouth is chewing. And whenever we are chewing, we are producing developing of the maxilla. And that's why I also work with the diet of the patients. I am always advising my patient to harden the diet. But that's a big issue because we need to change the whole family. Because we need to change the, the, the way that they are eating at home. So we need to deal with the whole family in that situation. But it's the same as when we want to to reduce the severity of caries in a child. We need to change the diet in the whole family to reduce the sugar. So it's in a similar way that we should work. And also, advising the patient to chew on both sides. Why? Because today we have evidence that when I chew on the right side, I am stimulating the growth on the opposite side of the maxilla, and I am stimulating the growth on the same side on the, max, on the maxilla. So I stimulate the mandible on one side and the maxilla on the other. When I alternate to the other side, I'm going to stimulate the other side of the maxilla and the other side of the mandible. Because we don't grow in this direction, and it was proposed before. We grow side by side. And that's why we have a lot of asymmetries in our patients today in the mandible and in the maxilla. Because we are not functioning bilaterally. We are functioning most unilaterally. So when I see a patient like this, 
at the age that I see the patient, I start working with. And one of the appliances, one of the techniques that helped me is myofunctional techniques. And I use the trainer, which is one of the myofunctional appliances, producing changes in the posture of the mandible. So in a patient like this, we start working, and this is the trainer. And basically what the trainer is doing is basically producing a Frankel effect. It's separating the buccinators and the, the, from the cheeks and the orbicularis oris from the lips to produce a better activity in the facial muscles and stop the pushing inward that they are producing. It has this little tag that is going to stimulate the tongue to sit on the palate. It also has some features here at the front that is going to reduce the activity of the mentalis muscles on the chin and it's going to produce a better lip seal on the patient. And also, it has, it has this rounded shape, shape that is going to guide the development of the dental arches in a better rounded form instead of a triangular form. So with this appliance, we can produce change in the posture of the mandible. This is a research that is published in the Angle Orthodontics of 2004, and it is showing that the mandible changed the posture and moves forward after using this kind of appliance. So with this patient, we start using that technique, combining with the planus direct tracks to guide the mandible forward, and you can see the difference now and how the mandible has moved forward. Basically, this is the result of changing the activity of the muscles. If I measure the mandible at this time, between one year, I'm not seeing a difference in the size of the mandible. But if I do electromyography, I'm going to see a change in the activity of the muscles, because the muscles now learn to hold the mandible at the front. And the mandibular growth is going to happen later. And by doing that, I am not only correcting the malocclusion. I am thinking also in prevention. And today we know that advancing the mandible is going to prevent pediatric obstructic sleep apnea, a problem that we have a lot in children today. A lot of children, they are not sleeping well because they are not breathing well. So when I move the mandible forward, I am preventing this problem. And there is evidence today that one of the best way to prevent sleep apnea in young patients is by moving the mandible forward. So by doing that, moving this mandible from this situation to this situation, we are correcting the malocclusion, but also preventing the obstructive sleep apnea that is already appearing in that patient. Why? Because when you have the mandible, and you move the mandible forward, the hyoid bone is attached to the mandible. And the hyoid bone has to move forward as well. But the tongue is attached to the hyoid bone. So if you think behind your tongue, you have the airway. You have the oropharynx. And the oropharynx is part of the airway. So I am opening the oropharynx. I am giving a better airway to my patient. So it's not only treating the distocclusion, it's preventing the sleep apnea for my patient. The other effect that I can get with the trainer is to produce transverse development in a very early age. And this is a paper that is published in the Journal of Clinical Pediatric Dentistry showing how we can increase the transverse dimensions of both the maxilla and the mandible. So you may see that in this patient, you may see it's a patient with a posterior crossbite with a lack of transverse development on the maxilla. So my first step was to correct the crossbite. And for that, I used the planus direct tracks. And by correcting through the planus direct tracks, I, I brought the mandible to the center. Then I put the trainer on the top, and now, Last week that I saw the patient, she is in this situation. So I think that is a much better situation. Yes, you may use braces in the future to produce a better alignment if you want, 
but it's a much simpler case, right? So we can produce these changes because we are using all the forces in the mouth. We are using all the muscles in the mouth. We are not working only on trying to move the teeth. We are using all the functions in our favor. We are using the tongue in our favor. We are releasing the force produced by the cheeks. And in that way, we can produce these results. And today, we have evidence that sleep apnea is a problem of lack of craniofacial growth and development. So whenever I am stimulating and guiding the craniofacial growth and development, I am improving my patient's life. Because breathing is a problem of life. That is the first thing that you do when you were born. Breathing. And if we don't breathe well, we don't live well. All right? So I am giving health to my patient. That's the idea. Use with this appliance, I can also increase the vertical dimension. You can see this patient that when I look at the mouth, it's a severe deep bite. So if I continue developing in this way, when I get in the late mixed dentition, it's going to be a very difficult situation for him. But if I start treating, I can produce a better appearance in my patient, but also to produce a better vertical dimension. All right, now if the patient was a better alignment, I can use the braces and it's gonna be much simpler for them, right? Or I can close an open bite in the mixed dentition. For example, this patient, we, when we look at the, open, uh, at the mouth, we can see that it's a very severe open bite with the tongue thrust happening in this, uh, the tongue position in between the teeth and producing the, the open bite, if we start releasing the forces of the muscles and putting the tongue in the right position, we can come to this situation. And it's a much easier situation. So whenever I have an open bite, normally the most common situation is that we have the tongue involved. And if I want to correct the open bite, I need to treat the cause, not the consequence. The position of the teeth is the consequence. The cause is the tongue. So my first goal is to correct the tongue position. And by correcting the tongue position in an open bite, you have the tongue between the teeth. If you put something to stimulate the tongue to come to the palate and to learn to stay there, basically the tongue is changing the posture. And when the tongue is changing the posture, the tongue is attached to the hyoid bone. And the hyoid bone has to move forward to permit that new position of the tongue. By moving forward, it's gonna release the, the stretch that is producing on two muscles, the anterior digastric and the genial glossus, and the genial hy hyoid muscle. And the genial hyoid muscles and the anterior digastric are pulling the chin downward in a clockwise direction. If I release that pressure, I'm gonna permit the mandible to rotate and produce, uh, to close the open bite. And then also, I have the dental effect because the tongue is not positioning anymore between the teeth. So in that way, we can go from this situation to this situation with a, with a functional technique. And also, in this patient, if you notice here, there was a lack of transverse development that was producing a, a rotation of the lateral before eruption. And then when we corrected everything, the lateral erupted in a normal situation because there was no space, so the tooth has to rotate to erupt. Now that we have more space, the tooth can come in a normal situation. So it's not only treating the open bite, but preventing other problems in the future. So this is something that Professor Petrovic said many years ago, the future of orthodontics is not only therapy and interception, it's prevention. And that's the way that I look at my child, but I look at my patient, and that's the way not only treating the problem that I am seeing today, is preventing the problem that could happen tomorrow. That's my philosophy. So here is my web page if you want to, to look for more information. I show you my book 
Unfortunately, the book is not available anymore in hard copy. It, it is sold out. I didn't expect that. I published my book in 2009, and three years later, was sold out. So I prepared the second edition, but the second edition is as an e-book. And if you go to my webpage, kidsmalocclusions.com, you can come here to read my book. You can register there, and you can read my book. It's free. So you have access. Everyone can go there and have access to the book. And I like my patients saying this. Thank you for taking care of my teeth and my fi facial growing. That's what I want to hear from my patient, to give health to my patient, not only looking at the teeth, all right? So whenever you have a patient, please observe what's going on. Listen to the patient, because they can tell you that they, they don't like the way that the mouth is. And if we keep this in mind, we can help a lot of kids and prevent a lot of problems. Thank you very much.